Today I want to talk about persisted queries in GraphQL and this will be more a theoretical video and then in the next one I will follow up with some practical examples. So in this video I will tell you what persisted queries are but at the same time I also want to discuss GraphQL and REST APIs. Those two approaches we use to create APIs and then uh, surprisingly enough, I would like to make a case that persisted queries may be a solution that brings the best of the both worlds. So we will compare and contrast GraphQL with uh, REST API, and then we will see that persisted queries, they are similar to REST APIs as well. Okay, so let's start with the definition. Persisted queries. Imagine you have a query, a GraphQL query. Persisted queries are just IDs that you use to represent the actual GraphQL queries on the server. So it works like that. You have this query on the left. Normally you would send it over the wire to ask for the specific things. But instead you are registering this query on the server and the server returns this ID. So now your client can use this ID to reference uh, the query. So initially you may think that's not really great because the reason I'm using GraphQL is to have this flexibility so that you can always choose the, the fields and you can you know, construct your query the way you want. But let's try to get a little bit deeper. So once again, a persisted query is just a ID on the server. Server remembers the query. You register a query on the server and then you can just use this ID to trigger this query on the server and that's all. So when we are using GraphQL, we usually have one endpoint and we are sending queries to that endpoint using the POST request. So we are putting those queries in the body of our request and then we can create any query we want because GraphQL is flexible. And it's flexible because it's a language. GraphQL stands for Graph Query Language. It's a language so it has expressions, which means that a consumer can create expressions in this language that the receiver may not like. So for example, clients may form expressions that will be difficult to handle for the server. So we are giving a flexibility, but is at the same time, we are introducing a complexity. You can think about GraphQL as a clay, you know, you have this material and you can mold it. You can form it the way you want, but you need to be somehow skillful and you need to take into consideration certain things when you are doing that. If you are skillful, you can create something nice, like a pottery. But if you are not skillful, the result may be not that good. So let's compare, let, let's contrast it with REST APIs. So in REST, we have those URLs and we have those HTTP methods and we have this uh, meaning behind them. So we can get certain things, we can create certain things, we can update certain things. And just by looking at the URLs and the actions, we may know that we, what we will be getting and, and if it will change the things on the server or not. But at the same time, it's less flexible because we are getting more data. If we are just asking to get the widgets, we may not be able to limit you know, the, the content of widgets. There are some techniques that allows us to do that, but it's more rigid and we need to work around this to match our application. So we have those two problems that we either get too much data because we are fetching it and not all the fields are required by the consumer, but at the same time, it's not that easy to specify that to the server. So, you know, at the point in time where the API and the client was created, we just met in the middle. It's like a compromise. On one hand, the server wants to be general to cover a specific case now and in the future. So you have this problem of overfetching and underfetching. So in underfetching, it means that you want to get one resource and then you want to reference another one. So you need to you know, perform another query and then combine the results. 
So if we compare and contrast side by side, we can see that GraphQL is flexible, but also verbose, while REST is very rigid. At the same time, GraphQL is a language. So you have expressions, and certain ex expressions can lead to problems. So for example, an expression can be resource intensive on the server, and you may not want to do that. You want to limit that. On the other hand, in REST, you don't have a language, um, but it's rigid and it's set in advance. So you, you may have those problems of, you know, fetching more or fetching less that you need and you have to work around that. So in a sense, we could say that in GraphQL, when you are opening API, you require less cooperation between client and the server because you have this language. So the client can, using the language, can ask for certain things to the server and the server doesn't need to, you know, think about in advance about all the cases because the, the expressions of the language that solve that. On the other hand, in REST, when you're working on a, creating a REST API, you need more cooperation between the, the server and the client because you need to have this, this spec, this uh, meeting point. And then in REST, since it's an older technique, you have certain things already figure out like the, the big example is caching it's pretty obvious how to cache things while in graphql it's uh, still problematic so now if we go back to persistent queries we have this uh, query and we just replace it with the id and when i say replace it doesn't mean that i'm re replacing everything because queries can have input parameters so you can extract that and you can say that when you are posting the, the ID instead of the query, those places where it re requires input parameters will be also provided in the query. So in a sense, you are registering this template with some holes, if they are any, and you can then provide, once it's registered, those variables for the query to be executed. So by using persistent queries, we are somehow limiting the expressions that the client can use. And this is very dynamic because we can always add new persistent queries or change the previous ones. So it's not as flexible as using the graph language, but at the same time, you can limit the things. So you can lock uh, down your API or you can provide this, you know, a fence around your API and you can say, well, these queries are possible and this are, these queries are not possible. And then in the future, you, you may change that. But you have this you know, method of limiting things. So now you can have more control how your API will be consumed and what you are providing to, uh, to your clients. And at the same time, since the queries are registered in advance, you can analyze them and you can cache them. So you can, for example, see that certain queries may take more resources or, or that certain queries may require you to do certain difficult things. So you, you can have this ahead of time analysis of your queries. So it's not like the query arrives, it can be any expression, and then you, can, you have to you know, see what was sent and then how you could respond to that. With persistent queries, it was registered in advance so you could use this time to analyze that before the actual qu queries were come in. And there are many analogies we could find to this uh, for those techniques, but one of them is encapsulation from object-oriented programming. So encapsulation is this idea that if you have a, a class, an object, you are hiding certain things. So you're hiding certain methods or you're hiding, hiding state and you're providing just a subset of things for the clients of your objects. So this way you have more security and more control over how those things will be consumed. And with persistent queries, we are somehow taking a similar idea to bring it over the wire. So now the clients that are re remotely you know, located can send requests to your API, but it's not just any expression you made certain work in advance. You said, listen, register certain queries, and then I will have time to analyze them. 
once it's registered, only those queries, this set of queries, could be executed. So if we said that regular GraphQL is like clay, you can mold it any way you want, and REST APIs are like uh, those rigid structures that they're already built, and you can just find a way how to use them, but you can't really change them. We could say that persistent queries are somehow in the middle in the sense that they bring the best of both. So they are like Lego bricks. They give you some flexibility because you can always register new expressions in advance. But at the same time, once you register them, these are the building blocks for your clients. So these are the only things they can use to make the queries. So you have more control and more security. You can see what's executed and then how on the server you can assign resources for those queries. Using those bricks, you can create almost anything you want. And if you don't like this particular brick, you can always replace that. You can change it because it's not that you are registering this query you know, now and it will be there forever. You have this degree of flexibility where you can change your queries as the you know, application evolves. And finally, I would like to compare and contrast how we are developing the apps. So we have those two phases. We have the development and, and production. So we, when we are developing, we are somehow deciding what will be developed and how. So if we are talking about APIs, it's about deciding what client needs and what the server can provide. It's like an exchange during development. We can provide you that and I need that and you are meeting in the middle. But if you are in production, it's already decided. You have those constraints and you can now use them. And then there is a new feature and you continue the cycle. So you're deciding about something or you change something that already exists, and then in production you're already decided. And then when you're creating your app, in particular a web application, you have your resources unbundled because you want to see what happens, but then in production you bundle them. When we take this analogy to GraphQL, in development you have those, this, this full flexibility, we could say. You have the language and you can create those expressions and you can see how they behave and what they do. But then when you are moving to production, you are just limiting that a little bit by saying only those that are persisted can be triggered by the client. And I think this is somehow the future of uh, GraphQL and of creating APIs in general, because it's very similar to REST, it at the same time has power of GraphQL. So yeah, this was very theoretical, uh, a lot of rambling. I hope you like it anyway. And in the next video, I will give you an example how we can uh, use that by building a React.js application. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.